Well, good afternoon once again, brethren. I'd like to follow up with something that was a subject that I addressed, uh, sort of touched upon at the Feast of Tabernacles, or at least on the last great day, and it was uh, uh, commented upon or ties in very much with uh, what was commented upon in the sermonette. Uh, because I want to focus our attention today on two things that stand or fall together. One has to do with our sense of who we are. The other has to do with our sense of why we are. Who we are and why we are. Our sense of identity and our sense of purpose. These two things are fundamental. And they stand or fall together. Now, I want to direct your attention here. We're going to look uh, at some of the accounts in the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah uh, to get a little bit of a perspective on what is meant by that and the role of identity and purpose. The book of Ezra starts out with the story of the Jews coming back to Jerusalem, to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, if you remember the story, Nebuchadnezzar had taken Judah captive. He had invaded Jerusalem and Judah about 604 B.C. and over a period of almost 20 years had come back on three successive times, finally the third time, uh, he had taken the nation totally into captivity, burned the city, burned the temple, and just uh, depopulated the entire area. And the Jews were transported. Uh, almost uh, 50 years later, uh, they had a turn in terms of what was happening to them because... Uh, uh, as the story went on, uh, Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. That's recorded, of course, in the book of Daniel. And the new king, Cyrus of, uh, of Persia, uh, issued a decree that is recorded right here in the beginning of the book of Ezra, in which he said, I will allow the Jews to return to their ancestral homeland. I'll allow them to go back to rebuild. Now, here was a people that had been captive. Some of them having gone captive almost 70 years earlier when Nebuchadnezzar had taken the first group in 604. And then over a period of about 20 years just depopulated the land, burned the city, burned the temple, destroyed everything, took the population into captivity, and Judah had lain desolate. Now finally they were told you can return. Here were people that for years, for decades, and we're looking uh, from the time of, of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, final destruction of Jerusalem until uh, the return here. It's about like the time from uh, Pearl Harbor till, till now. So there were certainly individuals who remembered the events, who remembered the destruction, who remembered uh, the, the catastrophe that had come upon them. And yet, the interesting thing is when the time came to actually pack up and go, uh, the, the evidence is that only about 45,000 people went back with the rubble. There were about 2 million or more that went into captivity. In other words, there are a lot of people who are all ready to say, yeah, boy, this needs to be done. But when the time comes for them to actually do it, uh, you find that there are not a whole lot that are really prepared to inconvenience themselves in quite that way. Because here were people who had lived in Babylon now for 50, 60 years. Families had been born there. Grandchildren had been born there. People had built, had established businesses. It was going to be very disruptive to their lives to have to go back to Jerusalem. They, they were all in favor of the temple being rebuilt as long as somebody else went back to do the building. But there was a group. Now, this should have been the zealous ones, though in some cases it may have been the ones who, uh, uh, you, you know, I suspect Zerubbabel attracted two groups when he went back. He attracted those that were really zealous, and he attracted those who had washed out in Babylon and figured that they couldn't get in any worse mess back there than they already uh, had where they were. You know, you, you tend to you, you tend to sort of get both both directions. So uh, he started back. He came back. And we have the, the story uh, as he comes back here in the first three chapters. And uh, we find that they got back right uh, before the beginning of the seventh month. They got back the equivalent uh, of about uh, a month or six weeks ago. And uh, so when uh, in chapter 3 and verse 1, 
we find that they gathered themselves there to Jerusalem. And uh, we find that they, in verse 6 of chapter 3, that they consecrated an altar and uh, began offering burnt offerings. The foundation of the temple was not yet built, uh, but they did consecrate an altar. Uh, that, that's brought out in verse 3 and in verse 6. Uh, and, and began to offer sacrifices. Now, just as an aside, you know there are prophecies that relate to the fact that uh, the daily sacrifice will be stopped in Jerusalem. And a lot of times we've tied that in and said, well, there will be a temple rebuilt. Well, yes, but this account certainly sets a precedent for the fact that a temple does not have to be completed in order for sacrifices to be offered. Here you have an account where uh, an altar was sanctified and sacrifices began to be offered uh, before there was ever a temple, even the foundation of a temple laid. Uh, so for somebody to say, well, you know, it would take them several years to build a temple. And, uh, you know, there's not a temple built yet. Well, it may take several years to build a temple, but it wouldn't take, uh, uh, how long does it take to consecrate an altar? I don't know, but uh, you're not looking at very long. Uh, a few days or two or three weeks or something of that sort. The um, point is that they celebrated, and they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, and there was great excitement. Here they had come back to do the work. So we find that uh, um, right here, after they'd been back a year and had sort of gotten settled in and tried to uh, uh, to get set up, that they began to do the work, uh, beginning in the second year of their coming uh, in the spring. And they uh, uh, they began... Uh, they began to do the work and to set forward the work of the house of the eternal in uh, uh, verse 9. Now, when we come down to chapter 4, we come up to something interesting. Chapter 4, verse 1, When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the eternal God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you. We seek your God as you do. We do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Asher, who brought us up here. Now, notice, what are we told? Number one, we're told here in verse 1 of chapter 4, these were the adversaries. These were the enemies. And they came up, and their first response was not a hostile response. They didn't come up and say, hey, we're going to tear this thing down. They came up and said, hey, we want to help. Let us help. And Zerubbabel said, no way. He said in verse 3, You have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. We ourselves will build unto the eternal our God, as King Cyrus has commanded. Now, why would Zerubbabel have turned these... ...just are the Samaritans. Now, who are the Samaritans? Well... They said, we serve your God, we worship the same God you do. We worship God just like you do. Did they really? If you want to find the origin of the Samaritans, just go back to 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17, you remember the story when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king. And there was problems and the kingdom split. And the northern ten tribes seceded and established their own kingdom, uh, and they made Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, as their king. And the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, uh, with their capital in Jerusalem, stayed loyal to the house of David. Now, Jeroboam, the first thing he did was he set up two golden calves. He put one up in the north in Dan and one down in the south in Bethel. And he said, now we've got a place, this will be where we worship. And there was a process that lasted for about 200 years until finally the Assyrians came in and took Israel into captivity. Northern Israel went into captivity about 120 years before Nebuchadnezzar ever came in and took the Jews, began taking the Jews. So in 2 Kings 17, we find in verse 6, in the ninth year of Hosea, king of Assyria, uh, he took Samaria and he carried Israel away into Assyria and took them up and settled them in the cities of the Medes. Uh, because Israel had sinned. Verse 8, they had walked in the statutes of the heathen. Verse 10, they had set up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. Um, verse 15, they had rejected God's commandments and His statutes. 
in his testimonies. They followed vanity, went after the heathen round about. Uh, verse 16, they left all the commandments of the Lord, made molten images, two calves, made a grove, worshipped the host of heaven, and served Baal. So, verse 23, the Lord removed them out of his sight. Uh, they were carried to the land of Assyria. Now, we find this depopulated, of course, northern Israel. And after the king of Assyria had depopulated the land, taken the people out, what was he going to do? Well, the way to make it productive was, of course, to resettle it with colonists. And that's what he decided to do. He brought men, we're told in verse 24, from Babylon. And Kutha and Ava and Hamath and Sepharvaim. These are little towns right around Babylon. So Babylon and its immediate environs. The king of Assyria brought these Babylonians down and settled them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. This is verse 24, 2 Kings 17. Placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel, and they possessed Samaria and in the cities, dwelt in the cities thereof. Now, here they were. They came in. Now, there were problems, of course. The land had lain empty for a while, and of course, what happens? Uh, well, wild animals had multiplied, and over a period of a few years, uh, uh, everything gets out of balance, and there were lions, and there were various wild animals that had moved in. You know, you have a town that's deserted, and there's nobody there. Five years goes by, ten years goes by. Uh, everything begins to grow up. Wild animals move in into deserted buildings. Here these people come in, and they're, uh, the, the wild uh, animal population had just really gotten out of uh, uh, out of bounds because uh, uh, there was nobody around to uh, hunt them and to keep them out of the way. So they were superstitious and decided the reason they were having so many problems was because they did not know the manner of the God of the land. So they sent back to the king of Assyria and said, we want you to send us a priest who can teach us the manner of the God of the land. And so, verse 27, the king of Assyria had one of the priests which uh, he had taken from northern Israel to go and dwell there and teach them the manner of the God of the land. Now, you know that he really did a good job uh, because uh, it was the, the way of worshiping the Sumerians. The northern Israel's way of worship had gotten them in trouble to begin with. That's what had gotten them hauled off into captivity. So they're going to bring one of their priests back. You remember where these priests came from? Remember the story back in, in uh, what is it in First Kings where uh, Jeroboam is going to uh, uh, set up the the uh, golden calves. First thing he did was he ran the Levites out, and he sort of advertised, you know, priests for uh, priests for hire. Uh, he, he wanted uh, uh, he was looking for priests. And we're told that he hired the lowest of the people. He got the people that were the down and outers, the ones that couldn't get a job doing anything else, the ones that were uh, uneducated, and it was sort of, uh, you know, look, I pay, you preach. And they were willing to take a job on those terms and uh, do what Jeroboam said. The Levites, he expelled, they went down to Jerusalem because they wouldn't support him in these golden calves he was putting up, so he hired his own priesthood, established his own priesthood. It's, it's the descendants of some of these priests that come back here to teach. We just got through reading what kind of things northern Israel was doing. So one of the priests, verse 28 of Second Kings 17, whom they had carried away from Samaria, he came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the eternal. So you know he did a real good job because look what the priesthood was teaching. And this is the kind of job he did. Verse 29. Every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwell. And it mentions, you know, the people of Babylon and the various uh, uh, the various suburbs each had their own little individual deity, and uh, they put these little idols up, verse 32. So they feared the eternal and made unto themselves of the lowest of them, priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the eternal and served their own gods after the manner of the nations from whom they carried away from thence. Unto this manner, unto this day, do they after their former manners. They don't really fear the Lord. They don't really do after His statutes or ordinances or the law and the commandments. 
which the Eternal commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. They feared the Eternal and served their own gods. In other words, they just kept right on with the same old paganism they had been following all along, but now they attached God's name to it. It's sort of like if you, you know, read a little bit the story of, uh, uh, let's say, when the Spanish conquistadores came over uh, to uh, uh, the New World, and they, uh, uh, like down in Mexico, on some of the shrines that the uh, Aztec uh, uh, had and their various gods that they served, they just sort of polished it up and said, "Well, look, you have been." serving here and, and, and worshiping uh, this goddess here, well now we're going to, you can still use the same shrine, still use the same, uh, the same thing, but now we're going to, instead of this goddess that you've been worshiping, it's going to be done in honor of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And so now, you know, we, we just do the same thing, we just call it by a different name. And you find that uh, those variations exist in many areas, uh, that it was a, a melding of taking the, the uh, practices that were already being followed and attaching biblical names. That's exactly what the Samaritan religion involved. We're told that they feared the eternal and served their own gods. They just kept right on doing what they did and yet they attached the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, to it. They talked about the Bible. They accepted uh, certainly the, the beginning portion, the, what was called the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Well, the Samaritans uh, preserved uh, copies, distorted copies. They sort of edited it and took some things out and, and, and uh, made a few changes here and there. But uh, they paid lip service to the Bible and to God. They just didn't follow it. In verse 41... Uh, here it says, So these nations feared the eternal and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they into this day. So the Samaritans had a religion that was a hodgepodge. It was really a preservation of the old Babylonian mystery religion. But it was now being done in the name of the God of Israel. This is the bunch that showed up at the door when Zerubbabel came back to do the work and said, hey, we're here to help out. Why, we serve God just like you do. And Zerubbabel said, oh, no, you don't. No, you guys don't have anything to do with us. You don't have any connection. Oh, why, why, we're good folks. Why, we, we serve God. We, we worship Yahweh. No, you don't have anything to do with us. We'll build the temple ourselves. You don't have any part here in the, in the temple and in Jerusalem. So notice in, in Ezra chapter 4, verse 4, when he wouldn't let them get involved, when he wouldn't let them worm their way in from the inside, then why wouldn't he do that? What do you think would have happened? He knew that the Jews would very quickly begin to sort of be intrigued by some of the practices and the customs and the ideas that these Samaritans had and say, well, you know, that's pretty close to ours and it sort of sounds, they, 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 do, they do something a little different, but they call it by the same name and it sounds sort of similar and, and you know, they're worshiping God too. You know, he knew that that was the tendency of people. He said, no, we're not even going to get started with that. Well, their real attitude came out in verse 4. The people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. So as soon as they didn't get to get involved in it, they started stirring up trouble. Spreading rumors and gossip and, and, and just uh, in general instigating trouble. In verse 5, they hired lawyers, went to court, uh, got an injunction from King Cyrus to, to uh, uh, put a stop to things, uh, to in effect put the work in receivership, if you will, uh, for a period of time, which is exactly what happened. The whole thing came to a halt. They wrote all sorts of accusations to the king. You know, it's interesting. You can take something and, and sort of put a twist on it try to make it sound bad. This is the copy, verse 11. This is the copy of the letter they sent to the king. Verse 12. He said, Be it known unto the king that the Jews which came from you are come unto Jerusalem, and they're building the rebellious and the bad city. Oh, boy, that sounds bad. You know, it's been a rebellious city, a bad city. And they're setting up the walls thereof and joining the foundations. 
Well, pray tell, how would you build a city if you didn't set up the walls and join the foundations? But somehow, what was normal and natural, they made to sound bad. So, you know, that, that, that city, that's been a source of trouble. The, the, the people that have been there, why, that, that place has just been troublemaker. Troublemaker area. And they're building it up in verse 13, and we suspect. See, we have, we have good reason to believe the reason they're building these walls is they're not planning on paying taxes anymore. Well, what was their evidence for that? Well, they didn't have any, but uh, they just said it. You know, you can accuse anybody of anything. They're proving it's a different matter. Uh, so here they were, having stirred up all this trouble, and so Cyrus issued a decree that caused the work to cease, verse 24. And it lay dormant for several years. Then Haggai and Zechariah came and, and, and stirred things up, and Zerubbabel rose up and began to build a house in chapter 5 and verse 2. Began to build the house. Uh, they went back to court and finally uh, King Darius uh, lifted the injunction uh, as recorded here in Nehemiah chapter uh, 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 chapter 6. And uh, he uh, lifted the injunction and, and uh, gave permission. So we have all of this difficulty. Now here is something that dragged on over a period of, of a, upwards of about 20 years. Now, surely, everyone would have known exactly what the Samaritans were and what they were up to. For 20 years, they had been stirring up trouble and instigating trouble. And undoubtedly, it was talked about, and Zerubbabel had preached sermons about it, and it was all, everybody had discussed who the Samaritans were, what they were doing, all the trouble they had caused, all the problems that had been stirred up. And so you would think, you know, here were the people that come back, they were zealous, they were going to do the work. Now the work is finally finished. They celebrated the Passover, as we're told here in, in Ezra chapter 6 and verse 19. So it's all solved, right? Well, let's pick up the story in the next chapter, chapter 7. Now, you have to study it closely, but you see that there's a, there's a gap of time uh, that had elapsed from the time of, of uh, uh, the time that Zerubbabel finished the temple on down till the time of Ezra uh, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes uh, was about 60 years. So here is a lengthy period of time. But of course, again, there there are people uh, who remembered the completion of the work under Zerubbabel and, and older people who remembered Zerubbabel and remembered these things firsthand. Uh, a new generation that had been born since that time uh, had grown up with those stories. They were the ones that were uh, that were uh, in charge. Now, Ezra was back in Babylon. And we find in Ezra 7 and verse 10 that he prepared his heart to seek the law of the eternal, to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So here was a man who was a priest, a scribe, uh, a, a student of God's law and had really learned it. And his goal, his ambition was to come back to Jerusalem and to teach the Word of God, to teach the law. So he receives a decree from Artaxerxes uh, giving permission to rebuild the uh, uh, Jerusalem and to bring back the law. Artaxerxes had also restored to him many of the temple treasures of gold and silver and, and brass that he was going to bring back. And so he did, and we read of that here in chapter 7 and chapter 8, talks about the group of people that were with him. And uh, uh, the uh, when he gets back, notice what he finds here in chapter 9 and verse 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came unto me saying, chapter 9, verse 1, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, and Moabites, the Egyptians and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yes, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. So here we are. And we find that the people of God are on the verge of simply losing their identity. 
They had not kept themselves distinct from the world around them. They were just blending in and fitting in and intermarrying with the world around them where they were on the verge of literally uh, losing their identity. Ezra was just horrified when he found out the state of things. Because you see, when he came back, they had had 60 years. They had finished the temple, but they never got around to the walls. They never got around to cleaning the place up. There were only a handful of people living in Jerusalem, and most of it looked like a bombed out, burned out, uh, you know, it, it was sort of like uh, if you were to go back over to Germany and find that uh, uh, they'd never clean, you know, here is a city and they never cleaned it up after the bombing of World War II. Well, here were people who about that length of time had gone by since they had been back and they hadn't cleaned it up. They had sort of lost interest in, in uh, rebuilding Jerusalem and really making it what it was intended to be. Had gotten caught up uh, in all the activities of the of the peoples around them. And Nehemiah was just horrified. And in verse 6 of chapter 9, he said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to you, my God. Well, he just, he said, God, I, I just, I can hardly, uh, I'm so embarrassed about what has happened in the state of things uh, that I'm embarrassed almost to come to you and talk about it. Just the, the, the terrible mess that things were in. Well, Ezra, uh, prayed in, in chapter, uh, in, in chapter 10 and verse 1, he prayed and confessed, uh, these things and really beseeched God. And, uh, they, there came assembled a great congregation and the people were all upset. You know, here's a, here's a revival. People are all agreeing, you know, yes, that's right, and we've it's been terrible, and yes, we're off the track, and it's been terrible, and we're going to do better. And verse 3, let us therefore make a covenant with our God to put away these foreign wives and to do these things. We're going to straighten things out. We're going to get back on the track. And... Uh, uh, Verse 5, arose Ezra, he made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel swear that they would do according to the word, this word, and they swore. Oh, absolutely, we're going to do it. And he went into the chamber of, of the son of Eliashib and uh, went there and he fasted and he made a proclamation and the people gathered themselves in verse 9 and uh, they agreed. Uh, that this was going to, uh, that, that they were going to do this. You have the, the account here in the book of Ezra. So the story has a happy ending, right? All, here, here Ezra came and he preached these powerful sermons and everything was getting back on the track. People were going to do it and boy, they were sorry and they, their heart was in the work. Right? Just turn the page. Book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah picks up the story about 13 years after Ezra had left to come back. See, Ezra left, we're told, in, in the uh, seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Seventh year of the king. Nehemiah 1, one tells us that Nehemiah came back in the twentieth year. So it's 13 years later. Not very long. Nehemiah had gotten some very disturbing word and it had been eating on him. And that was the fact that Jerusalem still lay waste. Nothing had ever really gotten off the ground. The people had talked a good fight, and boy, they were going to do better, and yes, their, their heart was in it, but nothing had ever really gotten done. He just ate at Nehemiah, and finally the king noticed that he was being bothered, and he questioned him about it, and Nehemiah told him what was on his mind, uh, that it really bothered him, that things uh, lay waste back in Jerusalem. And the king said, look, he said, I'll appoint you governor. You want to go back there and do that? He said, you can do it. I'll let you have leave, because Nehemiah was an official. He was a, a cupbearer there to the king. Uh, it was a responsible position. You see, the cupbearer uh, was uh, the king. The kings of Persia were always afraid of assassination, so it was a very trusted job to be the cupbearer uh, because you that, that meant you were trusted to uh, ensure that the king didn't get poisoned. And in order to make sure that the king didn't get poisoned, you took the first drink. Uh, <laughs> you know, so that was, uh, that was good insurance. You know, they they, they had the. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the kings uh, of Persia were always uh, uh, concerned about that. Nehemiah had a had a responsible position. The king said, "Look, I'll appoint you governor. I'll just you want you, you want it. Look, I'll I'll appoint you governor. I'll, I'll write out whatever decrees we need. You can go back, and I'll give you leave from here. And you can go back, and you can be the governor. You can you can build all the walls you want to. 
You can get things cleaned up. So anyway, this was in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, chapter 2, verse 1 of, as, of, of the book of Nehemiah, that he went. You read the story uh, as to how they returned. And let's notice when they, when Nehemiah came back, the, um, notice that uh, in verse 10 of chapter 2, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah his servant, the Ammonite, heard it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Now, Sanballat, we're going to see as we go on through the account, Sanballat was the governor of Samaria. He was the Persian governor of Samaria. He was a Samaritan. Samaria, of course, we've already read about the Samaritans. Now, they had stirred up trouble years earlier at the time of Zerubbabel, and here it's the same bunch, uh, same religion, same thing. Samaria, of course, by this time is a much larger, much wealthier, more uh, prosperous province. Judah is a sparsely inhabited, impoverished little province uh, that is the southern neighbor of Samaria. And Sanballat, uh, though he was governor of Samaria and not of Judah, uh, because his province was considerably larger, uh, he had the people of Judah pretty well intimidated, and he sort of ran the whole show around there. And, of course, we've already looked into the religion that the Samaritans had. Now, when Sanballat and his, his, chief, his number one henchman, Tobiah, found out that there was a governor that had come back, which you're going to read a little later uh, as you go through the account. We don't have time to go through every verse, but you find out most of the previous governors had been on the take. Uh, and they had been just coming back there, uh, sort of putting in their time and, and uh, getting rich. Uh, off of the taxes, and, and they hadn't worried about anything. They were just uh, uh, doing their job, this little backwater province that uh, uh, they served their five years or whatever it was and be gone, go on somewhere else. Nehemiah came back, and he didn't come back to get rich off the deal. He came back to straighten things out, and when Sanballat and Tobiah uh, found out that there was someone uh, that was really coming to seek the welfare of the children of Israel, it grieved them. Boy, that upset them. They didn't like that at all. Well, Nehemiah got into Jerusalem, and in the night, verse 12, he rose up, uh, took a few men, didn't tell anybody uh, what he was up to, uh, and he sort of rode around and surveyed the place and saw what a mess it was in. And uh, uh, verse 16, uh, the rulers knew not where I went or what I did, uh, because uh, uh, neither had I yet told it to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the rulers, uh, nor the rest that did the work. Nehemiah came back. He assessed the situation for himself. Uh, Nehemiah was uh, sort of a unique individual. You don't find many leaders like Nehemiah. He didn't need to take an opinion poll to find out if he was for something or against it, uh, to find out what the politically correct solution was. Uh, that, that was not uh, Nehemiah's approach. He was not somebody that was sort of vacillating back and forth, couldn't decide if he was for it or against it. Uh, he came in. He knew what he wanted to do. Nehemiah had a clear vision of what needed to be done, what he intended to do, and he was bound and determined to do it. Uh, so he came in, he assessed the situation, uh, called them together and said, look, this place is a mess, and we're going to straighten it out. We're going to build the wall so that we be no more a reproach. And uh, uh, this is what we're going to do. Now, verse 19, when Sanballat and Tobiah found out, they laughed us to scorn. They despised us. And they said, what is this you're going to do? You think you're going to build some wall? You're going to rebel against the king? And I said, God will prosper us because we, his servants, will arise and build. You guys, get out of here. You have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. What are you doing down here? Get back to Samaria. You don't have any business down here. You have no connection with Jerusalem and the people of God. Which, of course, the Samaritans like to claim, whoa, oh, we're the people of God too. Why, we worship God just like you do. But they didn't, you see. They really didn't. They just followed their old paganism, but they did it in the name of God. Now, chapter 3, verse 1, Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate and sanctified it, set up the doors even under the tower. Now, you would think Eliashib, boy, he was a zealous fellow. He's first, he first dash out of the box. He's the high priest. Boy, he jumps in there. He gets the priest organized. Yes, we're going to rebuild. Now, we're going to find out a little more about Elisha later, but notice here, he, he makes sort of a good impression. He's the first one mentioned to start building. 
And they started all this building and they got this great project going. And on down in chapter 4, verse 1, when Sanballat had heard we built the wall, he was mad. He took great indignation. He mocked the Jews. He spoke before his brethren in the army of, the, of Samaria. And he said, what are these feeble Jews? Are they going to fortify themselves? They're going to sacrifice? Uh, what are they going to do? They're going to get it all done in a day? Uh, they're going to revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are buried? How are they going to build this thing up? Why? They're not going to be able to do that. And Tobiah the Ammonite, you know, he was standing there. He was his buddy. Yeah, 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 that's right. Why? They built a little wall. Why? Fox can, can, can uh, go over their wall. Uh, their wall isn't anything. Ha, ha. Big joke. Well, Nehemiah kept on working. Verse, verse 6, so we built the wall. And all the wall was joined together. Now, you want to know something? They'd had 80 years to get that wall built. They'd had 80 years to get the wall built and they hadn't gotten it built. Somehow couldn't get around to it. It was too big a job and this and that. thousand excuses. You know how long it took Nehemiah to get the wall built? Nehemiah 6.15 So the wall was finished in the 25th day of the month Elul in 52 days. They dragged their feet for eight for 80 years. Nehemiah got the thing done in eight weeks. Now, we're going to notice a little bit, uh, they didn't slow down. Uh, you know, Nehemiah, uh, I, I'm afraid that uh, uh, he would have had some union trouble if he had been around trying to run a job like this in, in our day, because I don't think uh, uh, there have been a lot of people complaining. But Nehemiah saw a job that needed to be done, and he said, look, we're going to get it done. It needs to be done, and it needs to be done now. It's been put off too long. And all these troublemakers are around here and they're trying to stir up trouble. We need to get this thing finished. So, uh, when uh, Sanballat uh, saw that, uh, that the wall was getting done, in verse 7, uh, verse 8, they conspired to fight against Jerusalem. In verse 9, Nehemiah says, We made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night. And uh, there came people complaining and said, well, there's too much rubbish. There's all this trash. We're not able to build a wall. We've got all this, all this garbage to haul, haul off. And so uh, uh, Nehemiah organized them out. He organized a group to haul the garbage out. And he had two people there while they were working. One man had a sword and the other man had a shovel. And they, and they, they swapped off. And you come on down here in verse 23 of, of Nehemiah 4, and Nehemiah says, uh, Look, uh, neither I nor my brethren nor my servants nor the men of the guard that followed me, none of us put off, took off our clothes except uh, just to, to change clothes so that they could be washed. In other words, we even slept in our clothes. We were ready around the clock because these Samaritans were threatening to invade. Uh, in verse 18 of Nehemiah 4, The builders, every one had his sword girded by his side, and so he built it. You know, he had his shovel in his hand and his sword by his side. And there were people standing there. They had them ranged along the wall. They had a trumpet. They said, if they attack from one direction, we blow the trumpet and everybody converges here. Nehemiah organized this thing out in an eight weeks' time. He had a wall. He had the place cleaned up and had a wall. And uh, uh, in verse 21 of Nehemiah 4, uh, we labored in the work. Half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning until the stars appeared. Uh, so uh, it was not, uh, uh, you know, they put in some long days from sun up till, till the time the stars were out. In other words, if you could see, you could work. That, that was his philosophy on it. And uh, uh, he sort of made believers out of these people, you know, by the time it was finished with. Uh, they, they were, nobody was really wanting to argue with him. And uh, he was right out there taking the lead on it. And these Samaritans couldn't believe it. I mean, here was this wall taking shape. It's amazing what people can do when their heart is in it and they're cooperating and nobody's juggling, juggling around and sort of jockeying for power and position and trying to get all the credit. They were working together. They were cooperating. Uh, they were organized. Their heart was in it and they were, they were going for it. Well, Nehemiah uh, brought about several uh, social reforms. Uh, we find that uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, he was there during this 12-year period in, in verse 14, and uh, he didn't even take a salary during that time. Well, the former governors, verse 15, that had been before him, had been chargeable to the people, and they'd sort of gotten rich off the job. Uh, but uh, in verse 16 of Nehemiah 5, I continued in the work of the wall. 
And uh, neither bought we any land, and all my servants were gathered there unto the work. And so he put his heart in the work. Now, chapter 6, verse 1, When Sanballat and Tobiah and their crowd heard that I built the wall and there was no breach left, uh, though he hadn't set up the doors upon the gates, uh, Sanballat uh, came and uh, sent word in verse 2, said, Meet us. Uh, we'd like to have a meeting with you. They thought to do me mischief. Verse 2. And... Verse 3, I sent messengers to them and said, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. Why should I? Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? So I don't have anything to talk to you guys about. I'm doing a great work. Nehemiah was single-minded. He was single-minded. And so they sent four times after this sort, and I offered, answered them after the same manner. And then Sanballat uh sent his servants in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand and uh, he had all these accusations uh, against Nehemiah and yeah, you think you're going to be their king and all these various things and uh, Nehemiah uh, simply would not uh, would not pay heed and so the wall was finished in chapter 6 verse 15 it was finished in eight weeks time now you would think here is a revival. Nehemiah, Ezra had come back. He had preached. People had promised that they were going to make a covenant with God. They were going to renew their covenant with God. They were going to get back on the track. Things had sort of fizzled and they hadn't really gotten to doing the work. Nehemiah comes back. He's the governor. He says, look, we're going to finish the work. And so he puts his heart into the work and there's a crusade to finish the work. And they won't have any truck with the Samaritans. But let's notice in verse 16 of chapter 6, all our enemies heard these things and all the nations round about and they were cast down in their own eyes. They perceived that this work was wrought of our God. But notice in verse 17, Moreover, in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. We've already run into, into Tobiah. He was uh, Sanballat's chief henchman. Sent letters to Tobiah, and letters of Tobiah came unto them. There were many in Judah sworn unto him. Oh. So we find that, uh, verse 19, that they uh, came and reported his good deeds. They were saying nice things. Well, you know, I think you're really being sort of hard on Tobiah and Sanballat. Why, those are good people, and, you know, their religion's a little different, but but they're really pretty good folks, and, and I, I think you're being too hard on them. And, and then they were going back and telling Tobiah the things that Nehemiah was saying, and Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. So here was an attempt to... to to sort of worm their way in, to intimidate, to spread rumors, to just instigate trouble. Well, Nehemiah finished the wall, put his brother in charge over Jerusalem in chapter 7 and verse 2. Then he he made a decision that he was going to increase the population and bring in uh, 10% of the population of Judah and and, and, uh, have them live in Jerusalem. And uh, so... uh, the uh, um, so this was done, and in chapter eight we have then the feast celebrated, feast of trumpets, feast of tabernacles. The people gathered themselves together. Uh, chapter eight, verse two: Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, and uh, he read therein verse three, uh, and, and uh, from morning to midday they had. Uh, uh, had a long morning service, and he had this great big uh, uh, stage that was built where he could stand up and everybody could see him, and he read the law. Opened the book, verse 5, in the sight of all the people, and uh, stood up before them, verse 8, read in the book of the law of God distinctly, gave the sense, caused them to understand the reading. So he preached just as God's uh, true ministers have down through the years. He read out of the Scriptures and expounded the Scriptures. Didn't spend his time preaching, uh, you know, various ideas and philosophies of man, uh, but he opened up God's Word and read in it and made it clear and caused the people to understand the reading. That's the, the, uh, what, what's brought out. So you find they celebrated this feast. Tremendous feast. And this period of, it, uh, of uh, revival that's described here in chapter 9 is the people uh, were repentant and they were acknowledging that they were going to do better and all of these various things that uh, 
uh, how that they made a covenant uh, in, in chapter 10. This is right in the aftermath of the feast. Uh, that they would keep the law, that they would not intermarry with the people of the land, uh, that they would be faithful in their tithing. All of these various things that we have described right here. So finally, all the problems are solved, right? Well, just turn on over a couple of pages. We come to chapter 13. Nehemiah had to leave. His term as governor was up. He went back to Persia. In verse 6 of chapter 13, All this time was I not in Jerusalem. are the Samaritans. Now, who are the Samaritans? From the king. Obtained permission to come back. What was the circumstance when he got back? Well, notice. Right here in chapter 13, just a matter of a few years after the event we just read of. Chapter 13, verse 4. Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. Do you remember Tobiah? He was Sanballat's number one henchman. Do you remember Eliashib? Just hold your place there and turn back to chapter 3, verse 1. Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests and they built the sheep gate. Here was Eliashib. He was the high priest. He was zealous for the work, right? We find here in Nehemiah's absence, he was allied with Tobiah. He had the oversight of the, of the, uh, of the temple there. And he prepared... Now, now get this. He prepared an apartment for Tobiah. He said, look, Tobiah, when you come to town, uh, you need a nice place to stay. You don't need to rent a room somewhere while we'll pick this nice room up in the temple. You can stay right here. Why, we've had this chamber here. Why, all we had here was, uh, you know, consecrated items to God and tithes and things like that. Well, we'll just clean that stuff out and we'll fix it up for you. You'll have this nice apartment right here in the temple complex. So Nehemiah says in verse 6, and all this time I wasn't in Jerusalem. He was gone for a period of time. In verse 7, I came to Jerusalem. Uh-oh, he's back. You know, they never expected to see him again. When he left for Persia, they figured he was gone. And I came to Jerusalem and understood the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Now, you didn't want to grieve Nehemiah so. Uh, he was not uh, a guy to be tangled with. I'll tell you, when I read this, uh, i tell you, when I read this account here of Nehemiah, I'll tell you what it calls to mind. And those of you who were there can probably uh, remember. Uh, it, it always calls to my mind, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles in Big Sandy about 1981. Uh, and, uh, Mr. Armstrong came back and it grieved him sore, uh, various things that he found. And those of you who were there, uh, Remember uh, that uh, he was sore grieved. Well, ne- uh, so was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah came in and he found out this guy's moved in. He's moved in. I mean, it's not like he just sort of comes and goes. He's got an apartment right here in the temple. Nehemiah went in there and he says, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. You didn't want to be standing downstairs about that time. Here went the end table. Here went the couch. Here went the bed. Here went the lamp. You know, here went the pot. Here went the pan. Uh, you, you know, all of this stuff. Heave ho. Out the door. Out the window. There it was. He called in a crew. Verse 2 and told them to scrub the thing from top to bottom. You know, you just hear him. Yeah, get the life out too. Uh, you know, scrub this thing down. And... He had the vessels of the house of God brought back in there. In verse 11, then I contended with the rulers and I said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and I set them in their place. And you better believe he set them in their place. He gathered them together. And so then they started bringing in the tithe. Here's the whole thing. In a matter of a few years, the whole thing had gone to pot. Here were people who just a matter of years before had been doing what Nehemiah said, and oh yes, back on track again. Nehemiah's put things back on track. And they were in the work, and they were doing all these things, and they were zealous. They had renewed their covenant, which they had renewed over and over. 
verse 15, he looked and he saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. And uh, uh, he saw buying and selling uh, various uh, items. And he saw that there were people of Tyre coming in and they, they were doing all these things. Incredible. The people had so become just like everyone else that if it hadn't been for Nehemiah, God raises up the right man at the right time. If it hadn't been for Nehemiah, they would have totally lost their identity. They would have simply ceased to be. They would have just melted into the, to the general mix of the Middle East ethnically, culturally, religiously, in every way. They were just lost their identity. They lost their sense of purpose and they, they were on the verge of losing their identity. They lost sight of who they were and why they were. And Nehemiah contended with the nobles of Judah, verse 17, said, what evil thing is this you do? What is the meaning of this? What has happened? So he set guards around Jerusalem and closed the gate when it got dark at, uh, on Friday evening and uh, uh, it stayed closed for the whole Sabbath. In verse 20, uh, the merchants and the sellers of this kind lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. And I said, what is it you're doing? If you come again, verse 21, I'll lay hands on you. Uh, and they sort of understood that Nehemiah wasn't proposing to ordain any of them to uh, any particular rank. Uh, that was not what he meant by laying hands on them. And so they didn't come anymore on the Sabbath. You know, Nehemiah was, it was uh, uh, he was an unusual man for an unusual time. Uh, there, you, you don't run into many people uh, this way, but you you have to understand the seriousness of the situation. We find that the Jews, in verse 23, had married wives of Ashdod and Ammon and Moab, and that a lot of their children couldn't even speak uh, in, in Hebrew or Aramaic. Uh, you, the, the whole knowledge of the Scriptures and, and of the preservation of the Scriptures was at, was at stake. And uh, when uh, Nehemiah got through with them, they were all agreeing as to what they were going to do and things were getting going to get back on track. Well, you know, we've just gone through just two little books. Ezra and Nehemiah, on, off, on, off, on, off. Well, why? why? Why did they keep getting off the track? You know, there I, I think two reasons... One, one thing, let, let's, let me call your attention to one thing. Here's part, here's one of the root causes. You know, we saw about Eliashib, who supposedly was, he was the high priest, no supposedly to that, he was the high priest. Supposedly he was zealous for the work. He'd been right out there when Nehemiah came back and he was building the gate and had all the priests organized. But then when Nehemiah was gone, he was the one that let Tobiah come in and set up shop in the temple. And then we find in verse 28 here of Nehemiah 13, one of the sons of Joadiah, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore, nobody, not even the family of the high priest, was going to be above the law. You see, there were two serious problems that kept interfering with the event, the reforms that Nehemiah and Ezra had brought about, kept interfering with them lasting. First and foremost was the fact that the rulers, the leaders, the priests, the princes, the ones who were in leadership capacities never really had their heart in the reforms. They were responsible for the mess. And while they complied with Nehemiah's instructions and Nehemiah's orders, they never really had their hearts in the reforms. And secondly, the people. They stood there. They heard the sermons. They, they are responsible. They entered into covenant with God. They didn't have their heart in it either. They never really repented in their hearts from what had happened. And so it is so easy to begin drifting in and just beginning to fit in and to take our identity, to derive who we are from the world around. 
You know, there are those whose identity is not threatened and has not been. You can read some of those catalogs, some of those men and women back in, in Hebrews 11. Well, let's notice what it was that was different about them. Because we could go through the Bible. We could go through Judges. Uh, we could go through the book of Numbers. We could go through the book of Judges. We could go through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, we could, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, which we did. We could come over to the New Testament. We could look at James and Jude and uh, our James and First and Second Peter, First, Second, Third John, Jude. We could look at Revelation chapters two and three, the the story of the the or the history of uh, the, the the churches, the the seven churches, and we could see over and over again the extent to which the identity and the purpose of the people of God has been under threat of being eroded away. The people of God have stood in danger of losing their identity of who they are and why they are. Because who we are and why we are stand or fall together. If we lose sight of who we are, we quickly lose sight of why we are. If we lose sight of why we are, we also begin to lose sight of who we are and begin to fit in and become part of this world. In Hebrews 11, we read in Hebrews 11, the story is the chapter about faith, and we read of Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham, uh, various individuals, and we're told of Abraham in uh, uh, verse 10 of Hebrews 11, he looked for a city that has foundations, whose maker and builder is God. You see, by faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. When he was called, he went. He went to a place that he would afterward receive for an inheritance, not knowing where he went. Abraham had vision. He understood and believed God's calling. He looked for a city that has foundations. He looked and had his eyes set on the new Jerusalem. He didn't look back longingly from whence he came. Abraham never, Abraham's identity was never threatened. Abraham was never on the verge of just sort of losing his identity and just sort of mixing in with the Canaanites of the land, was he? You read the story back in Genesis. That was not Abraham's problem. Why not? Because in his heart, Abraham was persuaded. He knew who he was and why he was. He had a vision of God's calling and of the purpose for which God had called him. And that was important to Abraham. And his identity and that of his family, Isaac and Jacob, was preserved. Because they had a sense of who they were. They died in faith, in verse 13, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. If they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. They're looking for something else. They have a vision of what it is that God has called them to be a partaker of. We could go on down and we could look at Moses. He's certainly an individual whose identity of all people who, who um, could have had a, 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 an identity problem or who could have lost his identity. Uh, Moses could have been. You know, he was adopted right into the family of Pharaoh. And we're told in verse 24 of Hebrews 11, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming reproach for Christ greater riches than all of the treasures in Egypt. Because he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt. Now, when you go through the story in Exodus and and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, who was it that was always looking back longingly to Egypt? The Israelites, over and over. They were looking back longingly, 40 years. So Moses is the only one who had had left anything worth leaving. The rest of them were slaves. Moses was a prince. 
He lost his position because he refused to identify with Egypt. He identified with the people of God. He maintained and preserved that identity. Ultimately had to go into exile for 40 years, came back and let Israel out. All those 40 years, Moses never looked back longingly to Egypt. Moses wasn't wanting to go back and, and think, boy, you know, uh, if I could just go back to Egypt. But the people were. They were in danger of losing their identity because their identity was not established in their heart. You know, the people in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah complied. When the pressure was put on, they complied. But they never came to grips with the issue in their hearts and minds. There are those who may comply. But if we don't come to grips, if we don't embrace God's way in the heart, then we won't continue in it. Moses made a decision that he would rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He saw things in perspective. Whose identity is not threatened? Those who had a clear vision of what their calling meant. Jesus Christ's identity was never threatened because he never lost sight of who he was and why he was. In John 4, 34, you remember what he told the disciples? He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus Christ had that single-minded determination to do the will of God to finish the work. That was important to him. And that was ever before his mind. We live in a society that is estranged from God, that follows it, that has a totally different identity that is not at all uh, identified in terms of, uh, of uh, with God's values. Let, let's notice just briefly back in the book of Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus 20, verse 22. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land where I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. You shall not walk in the manners of the nations that I cast out before you. They committed all these things, and I abhor them. I have said unto you, you shall inherit their land, and I'll give it unto you to possess it, a land that flows with milk and honey. I am the eternal your God, which have separated you from other people. God says you're to be different. You don't have to be like everybody else. You don't have to fit in with the world. When we begin to lose our identity and just sort of fit in with the world, and you can't tell who are the people of God and who are the world, you've got problems. And... The value system that underlies this world is, is distorted. It's decadent. Whether you're looking at whether you're looking at fashions and styles, whether you're looking at music and entertainment, uh, whether you're looking at at uh, uh, you know everything from the, the highest echelons of the boardrooms to the lowest, uh, dirtiest streets of the ghetto, you're looking at a distorted, warped sense of value. Crudeness, vulgarity, immorality, immodesty, greed, selfishness, violence, all of these things that are totally contrary to the values of God. You can't fit in with this world and fit in with God. When we start trying to feather the edges and trying to see how close we can get and trying to fit in a little bit here and fit in a little bit there, what we soon find is that we begin to water things down and our identity stands in danger. When we have a clear vision of who we are and why we are, our identity is not in danger because we have a recognition of just exactly what's described right here in, Re in, in Leviticus 20. That we're the people of God. We're called out for a purpose. We have a mission. We have a job before us. And it's important that we keep that that we keep ever mindful of that, that uh, uh, because of, to lose sight of it, 
it is to put ourselves in grave danger. God tells his people back in, in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4, he says, Come out of her, my people, speaking of Babylon the great, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you be not partakers of her plagues. If we identify with this world and this society, we're fitting in the wrong place. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter 2.9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. We're to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, a special and different people. I'm not trying to fit in with this world. And it's important. Because we're bombarded. What kind of values do we get bombarding us the world around? It's important that we recognize and that we instill these things in our children. Because they're bombarded. You know, God places value, all the things God places value on. He talks about, uh, He talks about modesty. He talks about morality. He talks about being ethical. He talks about loving your neighbor as you love yourself. He talks about all sorts of things. Where, where, is that, where, where does that come across? Our kids, they, they get that off of MTV, do they? You know, this, the, 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 these are the styles that, that the uh, latest uh, Vogue fashion models uh, uh, promulgate. You know, these the these the, 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 the guides of morality and conduct that come across in the movies, come across from the uh, you know, whether it's the violence of the uh, uh the, the violence of our streets to the uh amoral behavior, the sort of anything goes if it'll make a buck a type of behavior of, of uh, corporate boardrooms. When God says we're to have an attitude of doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. You don't find very much of that. You don't find it from the highest echelons all the way down to the uh, to, to the dingiest trees. You don't find the values that God sets on, on modesty and morality. We see all of this, uh, this uh, excess. We see all of this flaunting, uh, brazen type of behavior, perverted, distorted behavior for our young men and young women. It's reflected in, in styles and dress and grooming and music and entertainment. It's reflected in, in uh, just the whole gamut of society. We need to be on guard because if we don't preserve our identity, then we stand to lose everything. We stand to lose everything. If we lose sight of who we are and why we are, over and over, that was the obstacle, that was the battle. We've got to come to grips with these things in our heart, brethren. If we come to grips with them in our hearts, regardless of what is going on in the society around, we've, if we reject Egypt in our hearts, we're not going to be enticed to go back to it. We're going to be enticed to go back if we don't reject it in our hearts. You know, back a few years ago, I guess a lot of us all thought that we had all rejected those things. Everything was back on track, right? Remember that? Brethren, there are those who rejected it in their hearts. And there were those who complied with a set of rules. That happened in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. It happened in the story of Judges. It, happened. it just happened throughout the time of the people of God. Ultimately, We've got to come to grips with what's in our heart. With whom do we identify? Do we identify with God's values? Is that what we want? Do we want to be like God, reflecting His law and His perspective? Because you can't fit in with the world and fit in with God. It can't be done. Because the values contradict. We have to come to grips with this because it's fundamental. It's one of the greatest issues to guaranteeing and ensuring 
the long-term success of the feast. We come back and we're excited. But brethren, we need to have a sense very clearly of who we are and why we are. If that is set before us clearly so that we never lose sight of it, we'll press forward, pressing forward for the mark of the prize of our high calling in Christ Jesus.